folks. Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the place where we talk about all things fantasy and sci-fi and also history because steampunk, the most awesome genre there is, is that fusion of sci-fi, fantasy, and historical elements. Today, after a bit of forays into historical fiction and other types, types of stories, we get back into the steampunk-ish <laughs> vein with the 2001 full-length, full-feature-length anime, Metropolis, which, strictly speaking, would be more diesel punk because of this 1920s aesthetic, but still, it's, it's, it can be classed there if we really want to do so. As the saying goes, it ain't steampunk to say something ain't steampunk. <laughs> so, you may believe, you may, you may get the implication here that this is based on Fritz Lang's classic sci-fi movie, Metropolis, and it is to an extent, but it's more based on Osamu Tezuka's 1949 manga of that same name with elements added from the Fritz Lang movie because surprisingly enough, uh, the manga, although inspired by the movie, uh, Tezuka did not actually see the movie, so it was he was basically inspired, uh, inspired by some of the ideas, uh, some of the stills and promotional shots from the movie, rather than the movie itself. Now, it was very, very surprising. A good friend uh, told me about this, asked me if I'd seen it, and I had not heard of this anime version of Metropolis, which, which is very surprising. Uh, it, it was a classic. I mean, it, it did do pretty well. It was one of the first anime films to ever be considered for an, for an Academy Award. And it's just covered with greatness as far as the as leading figures in the anime industry. Uh, like I mentioned, Osama Tezuka, who was um, considered the Walt Disney of Japan, a uh, very big pioneer in manga. And... Uh, also, uh, Katsuhiro Otomo did the, did the screenplay, and he was the guy who did the groundbreaking cyberpunk manga Akira. <laughs> and the uh, director was Rintaro, who has been in the anime industry uh, since uh, a little after I was born. So that's a long darn time. <laughs> uh, and it was produced by Madhouse, uh, that uh, studio that has done classics such as Trigun, Chobits, Hunter x Hunter. Uh, Parasite, and many, many more. So now let's get a little bit into the uh, plot of this. You may be familiar with the uh, plot of the movie Metropolis, which involves a great futuristic city, uh, uh, robots being created, and a vast gulf between the wealthy who live in the tall skyscraper towers and the poor who live down below. And so this has that, this has that theme, this this uh, movie does, and even even more so than the manga did, because as I said, it kind of went that uh, uh, Tezuka kind of went off on his own direction with that, although making it futuristic and sci-fi as well. So this Metropolis has a lot of those Art Deco uh, skyscraper images from the movie, or, or inspired by the by the Fritz Lang movie, it has that same kind of fabulous technology, and it also has a huge class divide between rich and poor. And the, here, there's a controversy uh, between uh, about robot labor, which is very reminiscent of the classic Carl uh, Chapek play R U R Rossum's Universal Robots, <laughs> which was the what well, actually where the term robot was was um, coined. It's like check for ro for worker, something like that. Uh, it comes from that, anyway. And uh, so as the city opened, as the, mo the movie opened, there's this announcement of this giant, amazing skyscraper tower called the Ziggurat, which is having been built by the city's richest man, Duke Red. And you see this celebration, this party, where all these people are talking about all this, the issues of the day, like the robot, uh, controversies of robot labor, robot rebellions, and 
the Malduks, which, which are kind of a right-wing, very anti-robot party, who wants to do away with them. And uh, beside, behind the scenes, uh, Duke Red is this popular, charismatic leader, but also sort of a robber baron type, and he's jockeying for power between Pre President Boone, who is this kind of a, a smug, a smug, uh, cigar-puffing character, and uh, as that's happening, as these celebrations are going on, all the fireworks and so on, uh, the Japanese detective, detective Shinsuku Ban appears. And he, he is traveling with his nephew, Kenichi. Now, interestingly enough, uh, interesting enough, um, Tetsuka did Astro Boy. You've probably seen that if you've seen uh, old-timey cartoons at all. And... Uh, uh, Shinsuke Ban also appears in Astro Boy because he liked to reuse his Tezuka liked to reuse his character characters from his various animations or various mangas which later became animations. Anyway, uh, so Shinsuke and his nephew uh, appear in town and they're searching for the notorious fugitive Dr. Lawton, who is supposedly participating in the illegal organ smuggling trade. And they go directly to the police department saying, we're looking for this fugitive, we need some local help to get around the city. And the, the police captain says, well, we're pretty busy with the celebration, but we can give you a robot assistant. <laughs> and uh, he, that's one of the cool things, that there's all these cool robots. Now, this robot, this robot detective, he's very... He's very straight-laced, he's very serious, of course, because he's a robot. And he's got this blue face and, and black stripes. And he has no name, just a serial number, but uh, Shasuku doesn't like to call him by a serial number, so he calls him Paro, <laughs> which is uh, named after his favorite dog. Anyway, and of course he's a robot, so he's not, not offended. But so they're, they're looking for Lawton, and uh, who is secretly in cahoots with Duke Red as part of his nefarious experiment he's doing. And uh, there's this um, assassin sent out after, uh, sent out after Dr. Lawton, and after killing Dr. Lawton, he sets fire to the lab, and there's this big disaster, big conflagration. And in the midst of this all, it all, Shitsuku and Kenichi are separated, and they and Kenichi finds this naked, glowing girl, <laughs> and uh, quickly covers her. Up. He's a gentleman. He quickly covers her up with his jacket, and uh, she is very, you know, she's like she's a newborn. She doesn't even know how to talk. So as they're hiding out in the undercity. Uh, he's teaching her to talk, and he basically thinks she has amnesia. And uh, but of course we know that she's not really human. <laughs> in in the manga, uh, well, she's her name is Tima in in the anime, but in the manga she's a robot called Michi who is gender fluid, believe it or not, for 1949 and can fly. Well, they simplified things a little bit uh, for this one, which I'm grateful for that. And it, uh, weirdly enough, uh, Tima and Kenichi are seem to be the only ones that don't realize that Tima isn't human, and they get up, caught up in the struggle between uh, Duke Red's uh, um, aims at world di domination and uh, the power structure that exists, including you know President Boone and the revolutionary Malducks. Uh, and all these malcontents and so on, and, and renegades and you know pro and anti robot factions. It's pretty fascinating, and so it's it's like an hour and forty five minutes long, but it's definitely worth every watch watching every minute. So the things that Mrs. Desperado and I loved about this movie, and it's a long list and in, in no particular order, uh, things that were fascinating as well as wonderful. First of all, the credits are kind of interesting. A very stark black with these vertical lines and horizontal lines moving across, almost no sound, uh, almost like they're paying homage to the fact that uh, the original Metropolis was a silent movie. I'm not sure. 
but it's very much at odds with the, with the uh, tone of the rest of the movie. Because we quickly get into these Art Deco backgrounds, these fantastic landscapes, these bright colors and incredible details everywhere. You see crowd scenes with tiny little people moving around. I mean, I don't know for sure how digital, how much digital aid they used in this. It, it definitely seems like they must have. There's this great statue that harkens back, this chrome statue harkens back to the original Metropolis and the female robot that was created in that, in that movie. And interestingly enough, she was the inspiration for uh, the design of C-3PO in Star Wars. <laughs> That's why he looks so, so retro, so cool. Except he's golden and she was silverish. <clears throat> so, of course, this being kind of steampunkish, diesel punkish, there are airships flying everywhere, all these soaring columns and so on, very old timey. So, other things that were really great the character design is very, very retro, very early 20th century. Uh, if you've ever seen the Belgian comic strip Tintin, that classic, a lot like that, you know, the rounded faces and the big eyes, and uh, a lot like Mutt and Jeff uh, with that really super long lived comic strip or early Disney which makes sense because to Tezuka was the Japanese Disney right uh, among the most interesting characters I found was Rock the Assassin who was not in the original manga they kind of added him in to represent the dark side of human nature he kind of looks like this wholesome he, he looks like this wholesome teenager uh, kind of like he'd be on the track team or something, like a dark-haired version of Fred from Scooby-Doo. And yet, it turns out that he's a ruthless assassin, carries a gun, uh, shoots down renegade robots, kind of like a Blade Runner. He is the adopted son of of Duke Red, who's kind of a who's kind of a jerk. He doesn't he doesn't treat Rock very nicely, and therefore Rock, Rock turns out into be into kind of a loose cannon uh, who moves the plot forward. The robots are very, very cool. There's robots of every sort and every type, and they're all adapted to different functions, uh, from Perro the police robot uh, to uh, uh, like floor polishing robots and you know window washing robots and and every every kind of thing that uh, you can imagine. I like the old timey feel of the the the, uh, the cocktail parties with people sipping champagne and smoking cigars kind of in, in defiance of the modern uh, PC health consciousness. And uh, then there's some amazing, shocking uh, graphic touches, like this gigantic catfish who appears behind a window, like there's some kind of, a, some kind of an aquarium back there. As, uh, just, as the scene is going on, as people are talking, it's just swimming back and forth. It looks kind of scary. And beyond that, you can see the sky when, and airships going by. It doesn't even uh, do anything with the plot, but it really, really adds to the feeling, to the tone of the piece. Uh, so, but best of all, best of all there, there is the soundtrack. There's this a 1920s jazz, just amazing, uh, including uh, Dixieland and classic blues tunes like St. James Infirmary. I couldn't couldn't believe it. All of a sudden, oh man, I know that one. <laughs> one of my favorites. Uh, I went down to St. James Infirmary, saw my baby there. And uh, then there's uh, there's kind of a bebop number they do during a a uh, when this robot fire brigade comes out and kind of combined with alarms. It's it's really funny. And then there's this, this orchestral music interludes that are reminiscent of. Uh, um, Danny Elfman's score from the um, from the Batman movie back in the 1980s. Very very cool, very very amazing. Uh, then of course there's this there's these retro scene transitions like a, an iris effect where that it uh, closes in on the characters as you're going from one scene to another. Uh, very nostalgic and. Uh, then you have the exciting climax where all future of all humanity is at stake, and there's just nonstop action, and things blowing up, and things falling apart, and it's just it's exciting. <laughs> and uh, the, what's really surprising, though, and soundtrack-wise, all of a sudden the sound goes away, and the song is something that people my age will very much recognize: the 1962 Ray Charles hit "I Can't Stop Loving You," which I guess, which is which obviously refers to the love between Kenichi 
and uh, the girl robot Tima. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very striking because at first there's only the song and then they add in the explosion sound effects a little bit later. Uh, almost as if, uh, I don't know, almost as if you're just spellbound. So I looked for a few things I didn't like about this movie because I always like to try to be fair and it was not easy. Um, I'm not sure how the animation was done, whether it was digital or not. There's a few places where it looks a little rough, but in general, really, really good. Uh, so it's hard to complain about that. Storyline's a little complex. Sometimes they drop a few elements here and there. You don't, you know, you don't, you know, some of these labor struggles, they kind of fade in the background. Um, but, um, and uh, some of them are, some of the story elements, plot elements are tropes. <laughs> Uh, which is what a lot of the critics didn't like about it. Uh, and you have, you know, the robot uh, falling in love with a human, etc. Human falling in love with a robot. You have the robot going berserk. And uh, the destruction of a great edifice with everything falling apart. Despite that fact, the tropes are done well. Final, final complaint. And this is, this is, this is kind of picky, but... As much as I love the late great Ray Charles, this is not my this is not not my favorite song by him. And uh, partly, in this situation, I think is too on the nose. Uh, yeah, we know that uh, Kenichi loves Tima. That's obvious. So, a little bit a little bit overwrought in that case. So, in short, this movie was awesome. Um, it's just Desperado and I both loved it. Uh, we both give it a rating of 5 out of 5 gears, the maximum possible steampunk desperado rating. To summarize, this has been our review of the classic 2001 animation of the Osama Tezuka manga Metropolis with strong plot elements and influence by Fritz Lang's 1927 classic of the same name. Thank you very much for sticking with me. Please give your comments down below. <laughs> Please like and subscribe. Help us get out the good steampunk gospel. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.